pop culture Hosted by Steve Ludwig I'm glad you Classic pop culture It's classic pop culture Hi everybody, this is Steve Ludwig, host of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture and the Beatles Hour with Steve Ludwig at planetludwig.com. Here's an interview we did with Norma Jean Wright on October 29th, 2013. It's from show number 13. To hear the entire show, check out the menu at planetludwig.com. And now, please enjoy the interview. And of course, the infectious Saturday and part of the medley that we just heard Saturday I Like Love having a party high society our guest the legendary Ms. Norma Jean Wright Ms. Wright thank you so much for being on the show with us thanks for having me I'm happy to be here your honor voice to be here. Oh, it's, it's our honor believe me your voice is so uh, beautiful and magnificent and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Chic later on but I'm, I'm Actually, I'm more impressed by your solo career. If you if if you don't mind me saying that, <laughs> that oh. I really loved, I love that uh, your Norma Jean album. Um, you know, Sheik's first album was certainly groundbreaking. Did that prepare you for your solo career? It it definitely did because I, after Sheik's um, album, we went out on tour. So by way of not only that album, but the fact that I was introduced to Luther Vandross and mm. with Nolan Bernard and being in the studio, I had been introduced to just studio recording. You know, some of it was good and some of it was not so good, but it definitely introduced me to the process of, you know, recording in a studio and Luther Vandross was very much involved with uh, some of the vocal arrangements with Sheik, and he was such a great communicator in helping me with, with my vocals along with uh, Nile and Bernard. And plus, we had gone out on tour, so I had been in front of live audiences, which helped me with my own um, solo venture. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me as if you're saying that um, Luther Andros was a very giving person. What are your memories of him? He was such a sweetheart. <laughs> And he was such a giver because he was so, so amazingly talented. And I know that initially when I went into the studio to record, me being like the first lead vocalist, a lot of the times Nile and Bernard had ideas for the vocals that they couldn't communicate as well as someone like Luther, who was a vocalist. So he was able often to translate you know, for them, right? You know, mm -hmm. even on some of my lead lead vocals. So he was he was definitely a giver because he gave so much of his his talent to mm -hmm. others. We're talking with Norma Jean Wright, the original lead singer of Chic, and of course a, a legend solo artist with the Norma Jean album. And uh, Miss Wright, you mentioned Nile and Bernard. We're talking about Nile Rogers and Bernard Edwards, of course. Um. I read, uh, in reading James Arena's excellent book, of which you're a big part, First Ladies of Disco, um, I got the feeling that working with Nile Rogers and perhaps Bernard, there was upside and downside. It seemed, was, am I correct in saying Nile was kind of a control freak or is a control freak? Or is that too well, strong a term? <laughs> well, they both were control uh, beings. <laughs> <laughs> say, oh yes, freak I was mean, not a nice word. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it, freak, freak. I mean, they, you know. well, basically, they had a vision, and and it is we can all see it. It it worked. They had a, they had a definite uh, ideas in mind, and both of them were musicians. So for me being a vocalist at times they it's just like with some of the songs that they wrote on for the first album there was a couple of songs one was Escuse Chic um and even with um Everybody Dance those songs weren't the perfect key for me I mean Everybody Dance was a lot easier but Escuse 
say chic was more fit for a soprano voice, and I was a an, an alto. So they would they had written a number of these songs, and they wanted me to sing them, but they weren't in like I said my comfort zone. But mm-hmm. it wasn't like they were changing the keys. <laughs> <laughs> so they so I was pretty much challenged I would say to 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 do these songs whether they fit my key or not but it was okay I think in the long run they allowed me to come out of my comfort zone and to utilize my top you know and yeah. at times even even stretch it and 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 do some like kind of first soprano parts well, but yeah. uh, I adjusted yeah, well, I was going like to say. It's like I had no choice because they weren't planning to change any keys. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah in fact, I um, got a cover of Norma Jean on your Norma Jean Wright album. Uh, I was reading in, in James's book, First Lady of the Disco. That almost didn't come about. Weren't Bernard and I looking for a quote unquote set kitten look from you, and you just were not going for that? You refused to do that? Well, I actually. I was the one who who decided to go with what I felt comfortable with. Mm-hmm. They really wanted uh, me to play up the the sexy sexy side because my legal name is Norma Jean, right? And they felt like, well, you've got a you've got a great look visually, and you could play up the kind of like. You know, Marilyn Monroe, whose name was also Norma Jean, is like, right. okay, mm-hmm. you can really play up that sex thing. And I was like, well, I don't think Marilyn ended up so so <laughs> happy at the end of it. I don't want to play up that heavy duty. I just didn't want it to be heavy duty sex, 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 because I yeah. felt that that I could sing, and I just I was more the girl next door mm-hmm. type. So I went with a cover that reflected my personality, and. Uh, yeah. They weren't that happy with my trip. Well, thank well, your fans were because I mean that is an iconic album photo that we all, and we all know it and love it today. You see that album right away. You know it's Norma Jean Wright's solo album. It's such a great photo and uh, and congratulations on getting your way with that picture. <laughs> thank you. You know, speaking of album, had covers, a little that, backbone. <laughs> oh, a little uh, uh, with with. <laughs> To, with Nile and Bernard, I think it's more than just a little. Was it was it tougher? Do you find have you, did you find with um, women female singers than with male singers? Was there still kind of a sexism thing going on there in the studio? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And for them, I think that they felt with that cover in particular. I mean, like so many people, even today, they feel that well, sex will sell. And I and for me, I just felt like the music will sell it quicker than the cover. Oh, so, and you, you were so yeah, well. You know, we, we all know that, that sex is still very much a part of marketing and mm. promotion when they're, you know, our women There's, involved. And then if they can play up that visual, you know, it's done. Today yeah, it has sure. never changed. As, as I uh, feel like even today it's even more. Uh, you know, I'm just going to ask, do you feel it's gotten worse today? I guess you kind of just answered the question I was going Yeah, I think so, because to, back then it wasn't like it was heavy-duty like videos at the time. It was just the beginning, you know, We, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like MTV and all of that. So the visual was very much a part of it because we were fashion-forward, but, but we didn't have all of the the outlets that they have today with, you know, so oh my today it has gotten even, you know, way beyond, I think. Well, not way beyond. It's just been prevalent throughout. I think. I agree. Selling you know, sex. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the story of the first thing that James for someone, had about. For some reason, Steve, you, oh, you're going in and you, out. So I'm how about now? Is this better? Much better. Can you, can, okay, I'm sorry. I was going to say, with Sheik's first album cover, there's um, an interesting story with that one. There was um, a white woman and a fair-skinned African-American woman, and you told the interesting story why that cover was chosen. Do you remember um, the story behind that? I remember that I was 
uh, under the impression that that part of the reason had to do with uh, they felt that if you had these two women on the cover, these two beautiful women, that again back to sex selves, <laughs> that the two women added mystique because nobody had seen the members of Chic at that point. Nobody mm-hmm. knew who they were. So part of the reason was, as as Niall will say, it was to add to the mystique, you know, of this group. And <laughs> yeah. his he he also said that he had he had gone to a show in the UK where he saw Brian Ferry. Sure. And, and he included two women, and so that eye candy factor again. And he felt they felt like if you put these two women on the cover that a lot of the programmers, radio programmers, would e- immediately gravitate to, oh, woo, woo, look at these women. And, mm-hmm. you know, this music sounds fresh and new, and that they would probably give our music uh, a quicker play than yeah, if I we went, had mm-hmm. all been placed on that cover with the three guys in my Yeah, and I, I wonder how and, much of... I'm so sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Norma Jean. No, but no, go ahead. <laughs> No, I was going to say, I wonder how much of the decision also uh, went with hoping they would cross over from disco into kind of more of a pop mainstream with that kind of a look on the album. Just just a thought. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That was a part of it, too, because the other the if if I think also with the fact that with the four of us, we're all African-Americans and we I think there was this feeling that our music would have been pigeonholed and only targeted to urban programmers instead of, you know, sending mm-hmm. it to, you know, like the top 40 programmers as well with those two women on the cover. Mm. They felt it would open the door quicker, for sure. Yeah. Early on, uh, you joined the Spinners on several of their live dates and sang the Dionne Warwick part on Then Came You. Now, what was it like working with the Spinners? I was so excited initially because that was my first introduction to... Uh, a professional gig with superstars, okay, because I at that time was uh, still in Columbus, Ohio, and I was um, still at Ohio State, and I, they were looking for someone to um, sing the lead because Dion wasn't able to travel with them, mm-hmm. you know, throughout. And I auditioned, and they hired me and said, wow, we'd like to, you know, keep you you know, if you can um, do this gig. And it just turned out to be, like, very exciting at the beginning, but I was disappointed at the end because it didn't turn out to be the way that I thought it was. And it, and I, I really don't it, talk about this a lot. Oh, okay. okay. But they were, very, they were very thrilled with my talent. And then behind the talent part, they said that they had planned to hire, like, Three girls, okay, that they would take out to do support uh, vocals and to also, I could have done the lead on the Dion part, but they just were more, they were very, very not professional in, in how they they treated me as, as, as a young woman. Mm. And I'll just leave it at that. So I, yeah. I declined. Well. Thank you for sharing that much with us. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, you're Norma I Jean. Declined. <laughs> and and certainly you're right, and rightfully so. Your Norma Jean Wright album, it sold well over a quarter of a million albums. I'm going to ask you a very silly question. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel good, but I think the album since then, because when the album was released, which was back in 70, was it 78? 78 it was, within right. A, uh-huh. Within a matter of, I would say... About four months, I was given that. I was given the figure of two hundred and fifty thousand. Okay, and since then, and and, and I've said uh, way over three hundred thousand, but yes. I'm sure by now it's sold beyond. You know what? That. You're, I, I am so sorry. I'm looking at the figures. The initial first sale. Silly me. Yes, it's got to be. My goodness, way over that by now. Um, but it makes me happy. I'm very. I'm very happy that. Uh, it has sold as much as it has and that it has continued to be uh, reissued and that it's considered, you know, a collector's item to many, many people. So I'm blessed. 
What does it feel like performing live now and seeing all those smiling faces out there? You know what? It's even more fulfilling to me now because after all of these years, okay, that mm -hmm. there are still fans that love my music. And I'm just so appreciative. I'm very, very grateful that I'm still standing and still, you know, making a livelihood in the music business. Uh, your attitude is so great. I, personally, I'll be 60 in, in April, and I loved your uh, what you mentioned in James's book about aging. It's kind of like, you know, hey, we're still here. And you have such a great attitude about ageism. Uh, what does ageism mean to you in the music business? It's It's got to be, I mean, you, you certainly have a great attitude about it, but there are so many artists that just can't, in their 40s and 50s, that's, you know, people say, forget it, you know, you're not 18, 19 years old. Isn't that a shame? It is a shame. But you know what? I find that with dance music overall, or a disco dance music, it hasn't been as difficult. They still love, it's much more accessible, and they seem to love you as you get older. You can gain some weight. You can, it's just been, mm -hmm. it's, you know, instead of like that heavy-duty pop mainstream, you know, we're, we're yeah. dance artists, and it has, hasn't been for me anyways in regarding the we, we're all going to get older okay mm -hmm. and all you can do is is try and do it gracefully and accept that age comes with time <laughs> <laughs> and 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 i think that the other thing for for me i've always been somewhat conscientious about what i put into my body so it hasn't been like um i haven't been totally, I think, just broken down with having to deal with some heavy duty. Oh my God, I, I don't have my health. I'm still pretty, pretty strong and very healthy. And so I just go with the flow, honey. Mm -hmm. If I get a, it's a wrinkle here and there. It's it's coming, okay? As my mother used to tell me, well, you'll see with time. It comes with the territory, and that's how I look at it. And if um, if we're still here to talk about it, that's got to be a good thing. We're still around. <laughs> I'm telling you, we can still get up and dance a jig, and I can still get up on that stage and sing. I think that if I lost my voice or something to that nature, then I would be affected, truly. Yeah. But if it's a wrinkle here and there, <laughs> I can handle that. As long you know, as I can keep, as long as I can keep singing, Steve. <laughs> absolutely, God bless you for that. You know, not to get too deep or heavy here, but do you think um, disco happened at a great time in our history? The Vietnam War had just wound down. Do you think people were just kind of saying it's party time, and disco was the perfect, actually, dance music? I mean, everyone gives it this disco title but it's dance music do you think it, it in our history that kind of came around as a result of the vietnam war or or coincidentally right after the vietnam war do you think people were looking for just nice fun party music i think that the vietnam war was a factor i also think at that time too uh right after the economy was also impacted yes. and often <laughs> When when that happens, people do look to find something to to be uplifting, to be able to go out and free your mind from a lot of the, you know, the frustration and the care. So I think I think both those things impacted on the the doorway, more or less being opened for music, and people wanted to get out and dance and just be more carefree. I mm -hmm. do. Definitely. Well, uh, Miss Wright, your music is going to live forever and ever. It just brings a smile to everyone's face. And um, is are there uh, before we uh, say goodbye? Tell us about your management company. I read in uh, James's book you have a management company that you're a part of. I do. I have a management company. It's called Norgene Management, and I also. I work with a couple of producers. I manage two producers under Norgene Management, and uh, 
uh, they're hip hop and R and B producers, believe it or not, but they're up and coming. One of the guys, um, he goes by the name of Black the Beast, and he's mm-hmm. he's worked with a number of of talented uh, young artists. And then there's another guy by the name of L T Thomas, and then I have another um, company that I work with. Uh, um, my business partners were Renee Goldstein, and it's called Dead On Management, and we manage a dance artist by the name of Raina. We manage her together. Uh-huh. So, uh, is there a website that our, any prospective artists can go to uh, for this, or do you have a... Contact. What I have right now, you can reach me at norjean212 at aol.com if anybody would like to get in touch. That's N-O-R... And I can give... N O R J E A N two twelve two two one two at, at AOL.com. A- Excellent. Um, to our listeners, I'll post that on the website right after the show. If anyone would like to get in touch with Miss Norma Jean Wright, Miss um, Wright, you know, uh, I want to say you gave Sheik's its distinctive sound, and you're one of the disco's true pioneers. Uh, with your permission, as we say goodbye, uh, may we listen to um, Dance, 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 and Everybody Dance? Oh, please do and enjoy it. Okay, <laughs> and Miss Wright, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I thank you so much. We appreciate you coming on. You're, you're a wonderful person. And thanks again for having me. Okay, good night. Bye.